So most everybody that watches our show knows we don't do it live. We pre-record it. And we usually shoot this thing on Wednesday afternoon. But somebody has been out river ratting around a little bit. And so here it is Thursday morning shooting it. So instead of eating more of a lunch or a, um, a supper meal, I figured we'd have a little brunch with some fresh stuff I got going from the garden. I'm going to leave that covered for just a second. So we'll get I, there. this is a surprise to me because I've not been... Uh, to what we're fixing to eat. Okay, so there's your cup. You're gonna need one of those. You're gonna need your plate and fork. Now, I didn't grow these, so let's start off with this right here. Let me bring this out. Let me bring these out. So, Florida is known for their citrus, but. Or used to be. Or used to be, but they're recently in the, I don't know how, when it actually started, but seen a huge surge in this push for Georgia citrus uh, lately. And satsumas is one of the things we can grow here. This is a satsuma if you've never seen one. It, it kind of looks like an orange, but it's it's not a, the skin is not as tight on the fruit. They're a little easier to peel. Real good, we'll show you one in a minute. But uh, there's been a kind of a surge in growing citrus in Georgia. And a lot of, uh, there's a guy down the road we know that's actually doing some grafting and stuff and what they'll take is really cold hardy trees or, or root stock and then they'll graft the satsuma onto it and you end up getting a citrus that can survive what little bit of cold we get here, down here in south yeah, georgia the reason we're growing a lot of satsumas up north here is because they they had this i'm pretty sure i'm right about this they had a virus down in florida called a greening mm -hmm. they really hard jumped on them hard and devastated the, you know, the citrus industry down there. So it moved up for the nor north, and the thought process was that the virus couldn't uh, survive in our type of environment. It's been fairly successful at this point. Now, they've always had to worry about that virus coming up and getting in our area and taking us out too. But they've created these cold hardy ones that will survive and produce well in our area, and we seem to be catching on to doing it, having a little something here. Yeah, and um, you've got a tree down at your house. My wife's stepfather in his backyard, he's got two lemon trees, a grapefruit, and a satsuma, I think, and they are just loaded, huge, yeah. loaded. And so this past weekend, I saw this on Facebook, and if anybody lives in the South Georgia area, you may want to go check this out. So uh, not but about 20 minutes from my house is a little operation in O'Clockney, Georgia, called Joe, I don't know if it's Joe Nina or Joe Nina, it's J-O-N-I-N-A -N Farms. Anyway, they were having this event, and I think they're having it the next few Saturdays, starting at 1 to like 5, called Clip and Sip. And the reason they call it Clip is you can't just yank these things off the tree. And so they give you these special little uh, pair of clippers. It looks like a, a big pair of toenail clippers. And you clip them off there, because if you just yank them off the tree, you pull that stem out there, and the fruit's not going to stay long. So anyway, we went there, me and the wife and Titus, and... Uh, is twenty dollars a five gallon bucket, so uh, wow, which expensive. it's a little pricey, but it was experience. They had about an acre of satsumas planted there, several different varieties, and these trees were just loaded to the brim. Uh, good amount of people out there. You could tell it was their first time doing it, but I, I think she's really got something there. Um, so we got us a bucket of satsumas, and I also got this right here. Now, this stuff right here was pretty pricey. I think it was 10 or $12 for this right here. And she had a commercial juicing machine out there. She was waiting on her sons to pick her some. She was going to juice some, but we left before that happened, so I bought this right here. And I don't know that I've ever had satsuma juice, but this stuff right here is mighty, mighty fine. Now... Like I said, it was her first time doing this thing, and she'll probably want to get her some branded jugs at some point. But uh, let me see if I can do this without spilling it. This stuff right here is absolutely amazing. It's, as, as I say, it's the cat's meow. It is definitely the cat's meow. Mm. A little different than regular orange juice. Yeah, yeah, it's a different flavor, different flavor. But this is this has got pulp and everything in it. I mean, that is good. I'd cure what ails you. So let's show them what a satsuma looks like. For might not be familiar. So you got there's kind of like this little air pocket in the top here. It makes them real easy to peel. And these things don't have seeds. 
tastes a lot like a, a, a orange, maybe a little different. I don't really know how to, sweeter to me. explain the flavor profile, but the, as far as the ease of peeling them and the no seeds, they remind me a lot of like them cuties you buy at the store, the little clementines. They ain't quite as tangy as the clementines, <clears throat> um, but these here are mighty fine. Now she had a variety there that made a real big one, like a grapefruit, and they ain't as good. I could, eat, small. I could eat a bucket of these in one sitting, probably. On the way home, that 20 minute ride home, <clears throat> Ty Ty was in the back there, and I'd peel one and split it in half, give it to him, and I'd get one, and uh, we went, I about made myself sick off of them. I got probably a quarter of a bucket left. Wow. Well, they're pretty good. They a little expensive, I mean, um, and she said she was going to do the event. Do they run out of Satsumas? She wasn't selling them wholesale or anything. <clears throat> and they also had trees for sale, correct? They had trees for sale. They were about $25 a piece. I almost bought one, but it was a cash-only deal. I'd run out of cash. Um, but she had trees there, and she had several different varieties. And if you, I saw some people asking her, you know, which variety she liked the best. Anyway, I thought it was a neat little, for her first time doing it, she had a good turnout and um Really good little agritourism opportunity. We see black as a blackberry patch you pick down from my house. We see a lot of you pick things around here. First you pick Satsuma operation I've ever seen. Yeah, those are good. So if you live in the South Georgia area, know where O'Clockney is. Um, it's about 20 minutes from Thomasville, 20 minutes from Cairo. Makes a good day trip. Nice little day trip. This place is pretty easy to find. Uh, don't go out there first thing in the morning like we did. Well, I didn't realize it didn't start till 1. We got out there about 10.30, and um, she said I had to come back once. We had to ride over to Cairo with Mr. Chick and get some mm. lunch. Okay, so we got that <clears throat> part of our brunch. Now let me show you this right here. So Ooh, that's pretty. Let's see if everybody can see this right here. So this is what we call a kale frittata. And that's one of them large pans that I ain't got that I've seen. Uh, let me pull these out right here. This, this is going to take a little story time here. So I got two types of kale getting ready out there. We got our dinosaur kale, which you got. And we got this Blue Ridge kale right here, this kind of frilly kind. Now this is a little faster growing than that is. Uh, so I've been harvesting a little bit of this. Now this kale frittata is something we make on Christmas. You and Mama and them usually come over to our house and we have like a brunch and this is something we always make. I know everybody's going to want the recipe, so let me give a little breakdown here what you do. The night before you're going to cook this, cook you some bacon, take you some of this kale right here. You can do the Blue Ridge, you can do the La Sonato. we've done it with both. And you just wilt it in a pan and some bacon grease. Doesn't take just a second to wilt this stuff down. Excuse me, wilt it down in some bacon grease, cook your bacon the night before and then put that in the fridge. The next morning when you get ready to make your frittata, of course we've eaten these for supper before, you just take your 12 eggs, three of the big spoons, I can't remember what they're called, tablespoons? Big spoons is what I call them. Yeah, three those of heavy cream, mix them together and then mix you some kale, tear up your bacon a little bit, and then we've used goat cheese, feta cheese is really good. We used a, a, a variety, a, brand of sharp cheddar called Tillamook, some cheese I've really been liking lately, in this one. And you just put it in the oven, uh, mix it all together, put it in the oven at 400 for 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, no uh, and you're good to go. I think this is a 12, maybe this is a 10, you think it's a 10 or 12 inch pan. Oh, I got a little pan you got there. That's yeah, nice. I've had this one since college. Um, Anyway, so about 15, 20 minutes until everything gets nice and done there. Hopefully it's still warm. So I'll cut us a little slice here. Clean your knife off here. It's clean. And when you, you're checking for it to be done, you just kind of, it's kind of like cooking brownies or something. You just stick your knife down in there. If it comes out clean, you know it's ready. Now, do you put anything on your pan to keep from non-sticking? I spray it a little bit, but if you got a good seasoned pan like this right here. You okay? You okay, I say that. What? You fix the mess up. Let me get my fork underneath it. Get your fork underneath I should have brought a, a spatula. It's gonna stick a little bit, but it ain't bad. I spit this piece is mine, isn't it? You can have that one. Yep. Show them what it looks like from the side there. 
Mm. Maybe I need a little more oil on it. Anyhow, this right here is a fine way to use your kale. There you go, y'all can see that right there. Yeah. And um, you can, I, I'm not gonna give amounts on the kale, how much kale I put in there. If I had to say, probably a cup or so cooked, wilted down, you can put as much kale, as much bacon, much cheese in there as you want to. You don't want your pan overflowing. But 12 eggs, a little heavy cream, kale, bacon, cheese. You put whatever you want to in there, but that's the way we like to do it. You know, it. besides the bacon, I could make all this with my yard eggs and my kale, and I, need, I ain't got no milk cow anymore. If you just use a little heavy cream, you could almost pull this off as a, mm. all your own products in there. Yeah. Um, if I'm being honest, this is the first time I've made this by myself. My wife usually makes it, and yeah. I cooked the kale and bacon last night before she left for work this morning. I said, okay, tell me how to do this, and I'm going to try not to mess it up. <laughs> and so I think we did all right. Yeah, it turned out good. So let's talk about what's going on in the garden right now. What's kicking butt right now? I got some corn. I don't believe it's ever going to get ready. I've had ears on it, and I don't know if it, the daylight, then got shorter messing it up. I'm just, it's got me worried. I had somebody the other day comment on that. They was worried about the corn. And it's just cold weather and short days. Uh, I mean, it's pushing it to make it this time of year. And it's fixing to be everywhere. So we're, uh, we're right here at the time where we get our average first frost. And I've noticed even this morning it's pretty cool. So our summer crops, summer fall crops are just about over with, just about through with. We can start concentrating more on these winter crops. Well, I got some Christmas lima beans I'm still waiting on, but I got a heap of rattlesnake pole beans. I done got them snapped in gallon bags. I got about four or five gallon Ziploc bags. I got the can this weekend. We're gonna yeah, do but if we get a 35 or 36 and a heavy frost, they, they done. They done, they done. You always playing a little gamble with them Christmas lima beans. Uh, sometimes we can go to Christmas without having a frost. So uh, it's a little bit of a gamble, but a gamble I'm willing to play. I got collards. I'm gonna have collards for Thanksgiving. Um, was, did you get your rabbit problem fixed? I'm working on it. So I, uh, I took a little mini vacation. I got all my posts set, and I'm working on fixing to get my fence up. And we're gonna talk about that a little later on. But I'm working on that. Oh, so you're doing a, a, some kind of uh, exclusion? Exclusion? For it there. Uh, I'm a little too old to be I thought scared. you had a fence around your garden. No, we put a rabbit fence up. But I'm doing it. We'll just talk about this a little later. I got more to come on that, but uh, I'm doing something different here. Okay. So we had a couple people comment and email us. Uh, we were talking about pest control last week. And um, we were talking about, we talked about our programs, and we said if your worm problem gets real bad, you can switch from the BT and go to some spinosad. We had some people email us that they saw on the label that said you weren't supposed to use spinosad on brassicas in Georgia. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, and that was true. I, I had overlooked that on the label, so I did a little research, made a phone call or two, and got some clarification on it. What happened was a few years ago, they, some of the entomologists in the, when I say they, I'm talking about the commercial farmers, the, cons the, uh, the consultants and the the professors, entomologists with UGA, thought they found some resistance to spinosad with the diamondback caterpillar. Well, when they did this, the first thing they tried to do is limit the use of that. And the home gardener always catch the brunt of everything. So the first thing they did was go in there and put a restriction on the label for the state of Georgia for spraying spinosad on some of these uh, worms and the brassica families. The one they had a problem with was the diamondback caterpillar. Mm -hmm. They also found some uh, some residual in some kind of rum factory or something somewhere else of the spinosad that didn't help matters any. However, the commercial guys still to this day use spinosad with brass because they're able to do that because the label affords them to do that. The label only excludes the home garden, and and, and so their 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 thought was, let's take the home gardener out of the game and maybe it won't affect the home the the farmers as much because the home gardener really didn't have any pool with any of this. Uh, In actuality, it probably wasn't a home gardener causing a problem no, it to start with. No, it wasn't. And so we talked a little bit longer, and I asked the guy, I says, well, if we're seeing this resistance, it had to be in these heavily agriculture areas. He said, yeah, that's true. 
he said the people that live in these urban areas where there's not a lot of commercial farming going on, we don't think this would be an issue. But like where we live. But like where we live, it would be. So, and I haven't noticed it. I haven't seen it at all, but I'm not saying that it's not out there. So if you lived in Atlanta or Macon or wherever where there's not a lot of, uh, I mean, these thousands of acres of brassicas growing where we live. If there's not a lot of them there, more likely you're not going to have that problem. But here's the ticker on that. We go, well, Georgia's what we call label law. So whatever is on that label is law. So you got to abide by that or you need to abide by that. And they did exclude the home gardeners. So we pretty much need to go by that and exclude spray, uh, spray of spinosad for worm issues on brassicas. Just in Georgia. Just in Georgia. Now, I'm not saying that it won't work for you. I'm not saying that I don't think it won't do any harm. I'm just telling you what the label says, and we need to go by that. So, Everywhere else, you're fine. Yeah, and, and, I will, and I will go ahead and say this. I've done it and had good results from it. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Ignorance is bliss sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one other thing I want to address. We have a lot of people on our Road by Road group on Facebook talking about this, and if you're not a part of that, Go to facebook.com, I think it's slash group slash row by row. You can search row by row. A lot of great gardeners in there with a lot of great things to say and, and pictures of their crops growing. Anyway, a lot of people were asking about, you know, we've been talking about a lot this year about growing your own onion plants versus buying plants and the results we saw last year with that. And people have been asking when they buy their onion plants that the onion plant grower doesn't want to send, even though they're in the south and we tell them they need to plant them in November, that the onion plant grower doesn't want to ship them plants until January or so. And so then they think, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be planting them until January. Well, what are these hoss boys talking about planting them in November? Um, my buddy Wes from the Naked Hog, he had a good comment Someone had said that the LSU website uh, or, or their College of Ag had recommended planting early, you know, January or so. But Wes said that if you look at the UGA recommendations, they say to plant them like we do. And he made the comment, even though he's a big LSU fan, that he trusts the UGA Ag department a little better than the LSU one. <clears throat> That's a whole nother subject. Anyway. So if you look at the right recommendations, it will tell you if you're growing short day onions in the south to plant them in November. I will tell you, and I know this because I've talked to these guys, I'll tell you why the onion plant growers don't like shipping you onions in November. Tell me why. It puts them in a tight. Mm. So the time from when it, onions are grown, onion plants are grown in the south, and by the time you know they're able to actually get those seeds in the ground when they're when they can germinate and then have plants ready to ship to you by november it puts them on a pretty pretty tight timeline and if they were to have any crop failure or any issues at all then then it's going to throw off that timeline so they do that because they're giving themselves a little bit of cushion and that is completely understandable sure just but I just wanted to clarify that so everybody knew out there. Yes, if you're in the south, grow short day onions, best to plant them in November. Your onion plant growers will tell you a little different because they're trying to give themselves a little bit of cushion. Yeah, where we get a lot of information on onions is, is Vidalia, Georgia is probably about an hour and a half from where we live. And one of our sales reps sells uh, a lot of the onion seeds up there, so he's very knowledgeable about the process up there. And we talk to him a lot, and he gives us insights on the varieties that are coming, the, the way the, the markets may be moving, some new new varieties. They have a test station up there where they do a lot of testing on different varieties. So we get a lot of information from him. And I'm going to tell you, there's more onions growing in Vidalia, Georgia, than they are the whole state of Louisiana. And they always plant theirs in the fall, and they make them big old pretty onions. Now, they have different varieties they plant that will stagger and come off at different times in the springtime. They pretty much all plant them within a month's time here in South Georgia in the fall of the year. That's right. And a lot of the varieties that they're growing, uh, that's, that's another way why we've been able to get some insight into some of these commercial varieties that will also work good in the home garden, and that's where we, you know, have been able to acquire some of these varieties that you can't find anywhere else that you're not going to find at your onion plant grower um, 
just because they're they're more commercial varieties uh, designed to make some real real big onions. My plethora onions, the one first ones I planted are looking great. Oh, mine are too. So seed potatoes is getting closer and closer that time of year when we start thinking about seed potatoes. I know for us it's the end of February, but we kind of have to plan ahead. We are seeing that there was a good crop made for availability on seed potatoes. Looks good so far this year. I'm proud about that because I was a little bit worried. But we look like that. We're fixing to start placing our orders. And we expect to have seed potatoes in for our Florida and South Louisiana folks mid-January. So they can plant theirs early. We hope to have ample supply going all the way through. We're probably going to have a, variety, a new variety or two this year. So excited about that. Yeah, so we hope to have the most of the varieties we carried last year. The samplers were really popular last year. We're going to do that again. We're probably going to add two more varieties, one to two more varieties. And um, we'll start taking pre-orders on the website for those early to mid-December sometime. Once we kind of realize what we can get, we'll start taking pre-orders for those. And then, yeah, if, if we'll... If we can get them in mid-January, which would be ideal. Yeah, I don't, I don't see where it's going to be a problem right now. The problem is going to be if it was to strike off cold for a week here, we can't ship them in freezing. We can't ship them to you if they're going to encounter freezing temps anywhere along the way. But right. that's usually not too big of an issue. We keep an eye on the weather. Yeah. Well, now what I said is ample supplies. To start with, we're seeing ample supplies. Now, what's going to happen later on in the year, I have no idea because... It's been, a, as we all know, it's been a crazy year, and we've seen things sell a lot more particular things than we've ever seen sold before. So we think there's going to be a good supply of them. I would tell you I'd go ahead and think about it a little bit early and make sure that you get the ones you want to get, the variety you want to get, maybe pre-order, make sure that you get them locked down, and then we'll ship them to you within plenty of time when you need to plan in your area. That's right. Okay, been adding a lot of new varieties to the site. I'm going to talk about a few of those right here. Let me set my plate down here in just a second. All right, let's start off with this one here. So, giant pumpkins is something that has that, that, uh, sparked my curiosity lately. And, uh, and we added, we've added one variety to the site, the Atlantic Giant Pumpkin. We got this one here I'm really excited about growing this prize winner giant pumpkin. And this one is supposedly can make pumpkins up to 150 pounds, which is a big old pumpkin. It, it takes a grown boy to go grab hold of a pumpkin because they ain't got no handles on it and pick up a 150 pound pumpkin. I've tried to grow giant pumpkins before and been pretty much a, a failure for me. Got to have a pretty good strategy behind these giant pumpkins. Yeah, so me and some of my YouTube buddies have been talking about this. Uh, so we did the giant sunflower competition last uh, this earlier this year, and we may still do that again, but I think it would be fun for some of us YouTubers to get together, and as always, our customers can participate and post their pictures on social media. But think about doing a pumpkin, giant pumpkin contest. The only thing is we're going to have to do it in the spring, not in the fall, because... Well, in our climate here in South, does not uh, lend itself well to growing giant pumpkins. Yeah, those people up in Tennessee and North Carolina up in that area have a lot better climate for growing them than we do. So we're gonna do. We're probably gonna do a giant pumpkin competition, and and we'll let it, people decide whether they want to grow prize winner or the Atlantic giant. Look at the germ rate on those. Ninety nine percent on those. So uh, I'm excited about growing these. I've been in the back of my mind and throwing around some techniques as far as. Once, once I got that one or two pumpkins out there that I'm really going to devote my resources to, if I want to put them on, I thought about making me a little pallet covered with carpet or something, something to set them on top of uh, in case the soils get too wet. There's a lot of ways to do yeah, that. You also need to think about a little shade for them too, especially in the middle of the summer. Build them a little teepee. Yeah, a little teepee. So giant pumpkins there. What else we got? New variety of pepper here called Orange U Sweet. And we actually have a yellow and a red counterpart to this one here. It's hard to tell from this picture here, but this is more of a pimento shaped um, pepper and it's kind of flattened. This one only gets about two foot tall. It's supposed to be really, really good for containers. And uh, from what the breeder has told me, the Peppers that kind of hang like little ornaments on a Christmas tree, really good for containers. And we'll be adding the yellow, I think the, I can't remember what the yellow one's called. The red version's called Ride on Red. I don't remember the, what the yellow one's called, but 
if you you know i'm thinking i'm gonna plant at least one of each of these side by side have the yellow the red and the orange really good little sweet pepper supposed to have really thick walls on it really good for stuffing what else we got a new cucumber i'm excited about this one this is a uh commercial cucumber variety called bristol so oh, that one's got 99 percent mm. germ on it too 55 days to maturity. Yeah, early maturing. This one is known for its straight, perfect fruits. It's the gynoecious variety, which means all female flowers. Boom, you know, want to plant at least half this packet here. And it's resistant to anything you could ever imagine. Uh, powdery mildew, downy mildew, papaya ring spot virus, cucumber mosaic virus, zucchini yellow mosaic virus, anthracnose, fusarium. Just about anything you can imagine. So this is going to be an awesome slicer that's just going to produce like crazy for you. And a nice straight fruits. Nobody want no cro crooked cucumbers. You know. What else we got here? So one thing, I, and I mentioned this on my video earlier this week, that I kind of forgot to plant in all of my f first round of fall planting is beets. I just it just kind of slipped my mind now I got some lettuce that's gonna be finishing up in the next few weeks and I'm coming there behind that and get me some beets and this is the one I'm gonna be planting I like the Merlin I like the Kestrel a lot we got this new one called Vulture and this is a more cylindrical shaped beet but not quite as long as our Cylindra beet is and this one's supposed to have a little better flavor than the Cylindra does so it doesn't wow. get quite as big but it's supposed to be uh, really, really good flavor. Doesn't get pithy when it gets larger like the cylinder can at times. And I think, looking at the shape of that, I think that would be a perfect pickling beet. It looks like an egg. Yeah, almost looks like an egg. They get four to five inches long, about two inches in diameter. So the vulture beet, excited about that one. And the last one, somebody on the show mentioned this and want to know why we didn't talk about it. We're starting to add some seedless watermelons here. And when it t comes time to plant these, we'll do a whole show kind of explaining the process here. But we got one on the site, and I've got three or four more I'll be adding uh, within the next few months. This first one we got here is called Tailgate. Now, if that ain't a perfect name for a watermelon, I don't know what it is. Tailgate Seedless Watermelon. This one is supposed to have one of the highest bricks ratings of Which any watermelon. sugar content. Yeah. So super, super, super sweet. Now with the seedless watermelons, what you get in this pack here, and these things are, are not cheap, not no matter where you get them from, you get 15 seedless watermelon seeds, and inside, let's just open it up, I'll show them. So in here, you get your, those are your seedless watermelon seeds, your tailgate seeds. You get 15 of those. And then you get 10 of these in a little bag inside the packet. And these are your pollinizers. And when we talk about these seedless watermelons, we'll explain what all this means. You gotta have these guys. This is an open pollinated variety. And you gotta plant these in the same plot as your seedless ones to so get your pollination. So what's your recommendation? Every third plant? Three to one ratio. So you get 10 of these, you get 15 of these. We'll give you a little extra of these just in case you don't get 100% germination. So you're gonna plant along the row, you're gonna plant three seedless seeds or transplants if you transplant like we did and then you're going to stick one of these pollinizers so in there. So it's real important if you grow these in the greenhouse and trays is to keep them marked which is which. Right, so three to one along the row. Um, we're right now including the pollinizer we're including is a Charleston Gray and the reason I picked that one is because it doesn't look anything close to what this one looks like. I wanted to pick something. You, I don't think you'd want to do Crimson Sweet as a pollinizer for this because it'd be hard to tell which was seedless and which was not. So Now the good thing about this is, is you can also eat the pollinizer. Right. So you can eat these pollinizers. The commercial guys, they'll, they'll, their pollinizers you can't really eat. Well, they've changed that a little bit. In, in a high, high market, you'll see them gather these pollinizers, pollinizers sometimes. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, they used to didn't. They used to didn't, but the ones they plant now, they plant them as kind of, they do this, they serve the same purpose. But if they get a very high market, they can also go in there and gather those also. They also they always plant one that looks a lot different than the than the seedless ones so that you can tell the difference in them. Mm -hmm. Now, if it were me, I would because these seeds are expensive and you only get a few, I would almost not 
hundred percent recommend transplanting them. I would them. too. Yeah. Uh, so that way you you grow in these plants in a controlled condition, controlled environment, and everything. And just put three seedless transplants, one pollinizer. So we use a, a Charleston Gray as a pollinizer right now because it doesn't look anything like this. You can tell them apart. You could use whatever pollinizer you want. No, you can't choose your pollinizer as far as what comes in this packet. They're already pre-packed with 10 Charleston Gray seeds. If you do want a different pollinizer, you can purchase any pack of open pollinated waters, melon seeds we got and do your own pollinizer if you want to do that way. If you wanted to do moon and stars as a pollinizer. Yeah, but you really won't want to mix a yellow, would you? No, I mean, there's a red moon and yeah, stars. I know, I'm sure you wouldn't, you, get, you wouldn't want to take a yellow pollinizer on a red. I, I don't, no, yeah. no, no, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Now, we are going to have a yellow seedless watermelon, mm -hmm. a little icebox type that I'm really excited about. But anyway, so those are on the site to order. We'll be adding a few more varieties. It tells you here on the pack, plant one pollinizer for every three seedless watermelon seeds. We try to make that real clear. So if somebody wants to order a bigger quantity, are they going to be able to? Yes, at some point. Once we get, we got to kind of get our duds in a row there. Um, but like I said, those things are, they're, they're pricey. Um, but I'm excited about trying them. I've never grown A lot of people, them. especially this younger generation, they just want seedless watermelons. So there you go. Bam, bam. Yeah. At your disposal. I'm going to try me at least a couple rows of them. All right. So on today's show, we want to talk about something that we've had a lot of people asking with this new kind of surge of people wanting to grow their own food. How big of a garden space do you need? How much space do I need to feed my family? And also, what is manageable? You know, how big of a garden can the average person manage and not have it get out of control? You definitely don't want to grow more than you manage because then you just end up with a mess of weeds. But not only that, even if you've been gardening for a long time, every now and then you need to sit back and reevaluate, is this the size garden that serves me well? And I'm in that stage right now. To give you an example, when you all was growing up, and I say you all because there was four of us, you know, we had to uh, we had to grow more. We had to put up more. We had to put stuff in the uh, in the freezer to last us more. We just needed more food. Now, with just the two of us, we don't need as much, and we have some other things going on. Maybe I don't have as much time to devote in the garden in the afternoon. So you constantly have to reevaluate where you need to be on your garden because, let's face it, we all have other things going on in our life, and we don't want this to consume us and it get out of hand and get frustrated. We want it to be manageable. We want it to be fun. So to keep that garden size right, so it provides you a lot of good groceries, it's fun to go out there and do it, it doesn't overwhelm you, it's something you constantly need to be focusing on. At least once a year, you need to be reevaluating. Right. So there's a lot of opinions out there online about how big of a garden a person or a family of four needs, and we've got our own thoughts on that we'll share. So I did a little research online just typing in how big of a garden you need, how big of a garden does one person or a family of four need. And a lot of sources out there would say 100 square foot per person. Now that's just 10 by 10, and that, to me that doesn't seem like a very big spot. Yeah, I did the same thing, and I've seen it anywhere from 100 to 200, but it's subjective to how intense you're going to garden, what all you want to grow, uh, what kind of soils you have, how good of a gardener you are, how much time you want to spend out there. So there's no cookie cutter answer to this problem. And that's the problem is we always want a we want an answer. So this is going to be something you have to kind of look at and see what fits you. We're going to lay out some guidelines, what we think, but don't take that, you know, for everything it said. Think about how it would apply to you, and then we'll kind of go from there. Right, so we're going to throw out some variables in a little bit that kind of would, would change maybe that square footage or that road length. Another, I found this, I don't remember what the site was called, there's an interesting site where you could put in basically how many people you have in your family, and it would give you a suggested road length for every possible crop you could imagine. And some of these I would kind of agree with, some of them not so much. So I figured we'd go through these real quick, like, and uh, just, you know, from what we know on how long a row of this particular crop, how much it will produce. So let's start off with beans. Now we're talking about for a family of four. For a family right? of four. Okay. So on beans, they suggested a 40-foot row of beans. Now I can tell you from personal experience with my rattlesnake beans, I've got a 40-foot row. 40-foot row of beans, especially of pole beans, is a heap of beans. You can put up beans. I think we're going to be looking at putting up at least 20, 25 jars of beans and been eating a good bit of them fresh. So I would say 
40 foot row of beans is plenty. Now this is a fall crop for you. So you've already grown a spring crop. This is your second crop of the year. So do you need that many beans grown in two succession plants? No, I don't think, but I, I do a sorry job growing beans in the spring. I do too. I, I just, it, it gets hot too quick on me. I just ain't good at it. Now I see people on a row by row group, beautiful looking beans. But uh, I do a better job with bush beans in the spring. Yeah, my bush beans did okay. Pole beans, I just didn't. Uh, yeah. In the fall, though, I can grow the fire out of them. But I would say that's about right. Forty foot. A forty foot one forty foot row per year. Yeah. Okay. And that's gonna give you something to put up. Broccoli, a thirty foot row of broccoli. Uh, that's a lot of broccoli. Problem with broccoli is it comes off all at the same time, so you do have to have some type of preservation method for it. Uh, you can freeze broccoli in vacuum bags. It does pretty good that way. We have done it. Uh, but um, i say that's close to being right. That's 30 plants of broccoli. It's a lot of broccoli. 30 right? heads of broccoli. Uh, cabbage, a 40-foot row of cabbage. Now, that is a lot of cabbage. It is, but cabbage lends itself to being put up and preserved a little bit better than broccoli does. You can make that all famous sauerkraut out of it. You can make sauerkraut. And the good thing about cabbage as opposed to broccoli is it holds better, especially yep. if you grow it this time of year. Yep. You know, we don't have to go out there. And commercial guys do the same thing. They wait till they get an order, and then they'll go out there and pick yep. a couple truckloads of it. it you don't hold. have to worry about harvesting all at one time. Carrots, a 40-foot row of carrots. Now, I'm assuming this ain't meaning a double row, so be about like a 20-foot double row. And I'd say that's about right on carrots. If you plant them thick, like I like to plant them, I'd say 20 to, to 40 feet there, uh, you're in business and you're going to have some to put up. Cauliflower is the same as broccoli, 30-foot. Same thing there. you got to find a way to preserve all that. It's going to be hard to eat 30 heads of cauliflower coming all off at the same time. The next one here I thought was interesting is corn, and they say 120 foot. Now, the reason they said this, I'm pretty sure, is they meant three 40 foot rows because you got to grow at least three rows. Yeah, I've seen that, and this is one of the ones I think they kind of lowballed a little bit for us. Now, we love our corn, and we always grow a little bit more corn than that, and it, it goes pretty fast. So I, I, I would say that's a little bit on the low side for me on corn. Yeah, I grew from my family of four because we put up a lot of it, but we've been eating it. I grew. Two plots of it with 10 or 11 30 foot rows. Yeah. I grew 600 row feet of corn already yeah. this year. I normally grow anywhere from 4 to 600, and we, none of it goes to waste hardly on sweet yeah, corn. It just depends on how much you like sweet corn. Anyway, I, I thought that was a little low uh, considering what I grow. Uh, cucumbers, 20 foot. You got a good producing cucumber variety like oh, a yeah. Max Pack or Brist like that Bristol we talked about earlier. You got them on the trellis. That's a plenty. You're gonna pick five gallon bucket full of cucumbers every other day. Or You'll so. have plenty, to, you know, to make pickles out of. And yeah, that's plenty. Now lettuce here. This one's a little strange. Fifty foot row of lettuce. Uh, yeah, that's a little much for me. And we love sides, love lettuce, but I'm gonna tell you, we can grow the fried some lettuce. Yeah, yeah. All winter long, we you grow. Yeah, twenty it. foot of lettuce is plenty for us. I mean, especially you succession plant it. Man, I don't. I think twenty foot is a great. I've been planting mine on about you know thirty foot rows. That's what most of my plots are, and uh, we'll knock out a decent bit for that thirty foot row. But I still always end up giving some away. I think fifty is a, is a little much there. Now this one I think is 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 too low. Okra, they said just a 10 foot row. Oh yeah, we plant more than that. Of course, we love our okra. But 10, 10 okra plants, I mean, you're gonna get, you gotta think every time you harvest it, you're gonna get, say you plant jambalaya, you're gonna get two to three pods per harvest. Uh, on 10 foot, that ain't, that ain't a whole lot of okra by the time you cut it up and cook it. And okra don't hold that well. It'll hold for a few days in the fridge, but don't hold that well. So you just be eating little helpings of okra here and there. Um, I would say you need closer to 20 to 30 foot. That's okra. normally what I plant. He's in more 20 to 30 feet. Onions, 40 foot. I'd say that that's pretty close. I would say if you got a good way to store them, you could you could easily do 80 or more on the onions just mm -hmm. because they store so well. Pepper is 20 feet, and this one blows it out of the water for me. I by no means need 20 foot of pepper. It just depends on what, how big of a variety of peppers you want. Yeah, but man, I normally just plant, I'll plant maybe 10 foot of peppers and have plenty. I Our banana that. peppers make all the way just about till, till frost. I always overdo it on peppers. 
summer squash, they say 20 feet of summer squash, that's probably about right. That's a lot of summer squash. That's, if you put them, we usually put ours three feet apart or so, and that's that's a heap of squash. Now, winter squash here, it, this is going to depend on variety a little bit. This is 20 foot. I would say you probably want to grow a little bit more than that, considering these things store so well, and it's such a valuable food source. Yeah, and they, a lot of those vines need some room to grow, so... I agree with you. And then this was the one that blew me away. It's tomatoes. They said a hundred foot of tomatoes. They don't grow tomatoes like I do. <laughs> I'll guarantee you, if you grow fifty foot like we do, you got a plenty to feed you, the family, and the family next door. And put up a heap of. Oh man, that's a hundred foot of tomatoes, man. I ain't grown a hundred foot of tomatoes in a long, long time. That is a. Uh, that's in a, fact, this last year, I tell you what, we grew that worked out pretty good. There was two of us. We put up some weed. All the matters we wanted, we gave some away. I think I had 20 feet of tomatoes. A 20 foot row. No, I had, no, I had two, because I did grow a different variety. So I had two 20 foot rows of, of tomatoes. I grew uh, another variety just, just to test, see how it was going to do against my Bella Roses. Yeah, I had two 20 foot rows, and we had tomatoes go to waste. I, I grew a bunch this year because I was doing those trials. I had three or four 40 foot rows of, of just home run producers and then some kind of experimental stuff. And uh, well, we must have put up 40, 30, 40 jars of tomatoes and sauce and everything, more than we'll need for a whole year. And then I gave away till then there. I had people wanting to put up some and I was giving away buckets at the time. So if you did, I think a 20 foot row, plant them two feet apart. And you're thinking determinants like we I grow. I think determinants is plenty for a family of two. You're talking about 10 plants. Yeah, good I mean, they producing don't sound like much, determinants. But you take care of them, treat them right, and they'll be good to you. All right, so those, those were some of the suggestions. Some we agree with, some we, we would vary slightly. And like you said, there's not a one-size-fits-all solution to this. There's a lot of different variables that come into play as to how much you're going to need for your family. And so I wrote down a few things to consider here that might vary from what we just mentioned there about how much you would want to plant. The first one here is how big of a variety of crops or crop families are you going to be planting? And the thing to think about here is the lesser the variety, the more difficult it's going to be to rotate and keep your soil in good shape. So if you're the type of person, and I know plenty of people, I can ride down the road from my house and see somebody, all they're going to grow every year is some corn, some okra, and a few squash. And in the wintertime, all they're going to grow is some mustard and some turnips. Mm -hmm. That's all they're going to grow. And what happens over time, if you go talk to them, they'll tell you that their garden kind of starts declining a little bit after five or six years, just kind of beating it down with the same crops, not having a lot of diversity there. So if, if you want to, if you're the type of person, you just like a few things, um, th that's going to become problematic over time uh, as far as keeping your soil healthy. It's better to grow a wider variety. It's going to help out with it your is, rotation. But if you're in that situation, one of the things you can do is just every now and then move your garden to a different spot. Right, if you got room yeah. uh, to do it there. So uh, you got to figure out how much of this you want to grow. Do you want to grow everything we mentioned on that list or just five or six of those things we mentioned on that list? The more variety you grow, the more room you're going to need, uh, but also that's going to help you out with rotation down the line. The second thing here is we just we just went through a row length on these things. We didn't really talk about how much space each respective crop takes up. So if you're going to be growing crops that require a lot of space, like winter squash or summer squash or pumpkins, uh, you're going to need a lot more room as far as that overall square footage size of garden. Also, if you're going to be growing crops that require multiple rows for pollination, like corn, yep. you're going to need a lot more room for that. Can't just plant one row of corn. Right. So uh space hogs winter squash or pumpkins or corn uh are gonna gonna require a bigger garden if you're growing a lot of those things and you ain't gonna grow much pumpkins or corn in a 10 by 10 thousand square foot plot right number three and this is a this is probably one of the biggest ones in my opinion are you gonna be eating this stuff just fresh or are you gonna be trying to preserve some of the harvest yeah, one of the figures I've seen is if you want to grow enough food, let's see here, 
if you want to grow enough food for one person to eat pretty much entirely out of that garden and that means you're going to have to preserve a lot of it you're looking at around 4,000 square feet per person per year a 4,000 square foot garden that's basically a, like a 60 by 65 per person now we're talking about you eating primarily out of this garden you're not going to be buying a lot of groceries so think about that you can provide a family of four you'd have to multiply it times that uh, four so you're looking at what two what's four times two i mean four six times four is 36 300 be 360 by 360. Six times four is 24. 24. You talking about doing 24. Alabama math? Over yeah, there. Alabama 24. You talking about 240 by 240? You talking about an acre? Basically, if you go with this particular projection, you could feed a family of four year round out of that garden if you preserved a lot of it. That's a it, lot of garden. That is a lot of garden. And going back to our beans example earlier, we talked about the 40 foot row of beans. If you're just going to eat them fresh. You can go to Walmart and buy you one of them little cheap little wooden arbor things and plant you a few bean plants around the side of them, make you a little teepee with bamboo, and that'd be plenty of pole beans if you're just going to eat them fresh. Yeah. If you're preserving, that 40-foot row comes into play there yeah. if you're going to put up a bunch of them. Now, pretty much forget about giving any of this away. It just don't work out very well. Now, you may have some extra that you can give away, but don't be planting any to be given away. Don't you're be planning. You're going to usually always have some to give you're away. You're going to have some to give away. If you start planting some, planning to give away, you're going to be discouraged because folks ain't going to come and get it. That's right. Uh, number four thing to consider here is are you going to be growing one season per year, two seasons per year? Four or three. Or year round like we do. Uh, we don't, re we just, we just are always planting. The, well, we do have a little break in September. Um, and August and September, but we're pretty much growing year round. A lot of people are just going to plant a spring garden. Mm -hmm. Maybe because their climate only allows for that. Some people just get tired of it in the summer and they don't want to fool with it the rest of the year. So how many seasons are you going to be growing here? The more seasons you grow, the wider diversity you can grow. And, and personally, fall garden is my favorite uh, time to garden because it's nice and cool outside. The next one, the last one here is has to do with kind of taking care of your soil and taking care of everything. Are you going to be incorporating cover crops into this mix or letting some plots rest? It, it, if that's the case, whether you're doing raised beds or whether you're doing subplots like we have, something to take into consideration. Are you just going to farm it hard? Or are you going to have your, excuse me, a system set up so you can move things around, take care of your soil a little better? Yeah. Now, one thing we need to talk about is, you know, we've always encouraged people when they start gardening to start small and work your way up. When we do that, we're thinking about a young family. So let's take a young family of four. They cut a couple of small children. They want to go out there and small, start a small garden because they don't really know a lot about what they're doing. They're having to learn on the fly as they go, which is great. They start off small. They kind of get under the bed a little bit, get some confidence, and they make their garden bigger every year. As those kids grow up, the you know the need for food and fresh vegetables grows so you need to grow up more every year you start to get better at preserving you start to get more comfortable and you start putting more things up so you need more room every year let's look at the flip side of that just for a minute say you've been gardening for a long time as i have and you get to a point where you start to get a little frustrated because you can't tend to everything that you've got or you start making a lot more than what you can give away or consume then start going about it the other way and this is where i'm at start downsizing your garden instead of getting frustrating and quit just bring it back down to a more manageable level so that you can look after it and still provide a good amount of fresh fruit and vegetables for your family and have it there but bring it down and don't feel guilty about it i'll give you another little perspective on that uh, which i've been experiencing lately so i've got 10 plots and and the, the reason, the, the primary reason I have such a big garden, I have those 10 plots that are all about 1,000 square feet, is, is just for the channel. Um, so we can just show you all these different varieties, all these different techniques, ways to do things. It's strictly for the channel. Now, we started a market farm run operation because we had so much extra stuff. We, that became time consuming. We stopped that this year. 
I'm keeping my 10 plots, but I'm not using that many of them at a time. And what it's allowed me to do is to do a lot more cover cropping, a lot more rotation, and kind of taking care of my uh, soils better. So if you do have a big garden or a lot of plots and you want to downsize, it doesn't necessarily always mean you have to get rid of those existing plots. You can leave them there and just kind of nurture those plots and get on a, a better, longer rotation Absolutely. and you're going to be successful when you do yep. plant in that plot better. So I'm doing the same thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm taking 2,000 square feet and I know it sounds like a lot but I'm an overachiever. So I'm taking 2,000 square feet and I'm going to garden at 2,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let my other plots either cover crop or rest. Mm -hmm. Pretty much live. put cover crops on them, long-term cover crops, and just let them stay out there, let them recoup, let them regenerate somewhat so they can move around. But I'm going to work at 2,000 square feet, and I'm working intensely, and I'm going to do a better job looking after it, and I'm going to grow more than what I need. I mean, I have had a tendency in the past plant way more than what we need. You're probably going to still grow a bunch of watermelons. I'm going to still grow watermelons, and I'm going to still grow corn, but I'm talking about like the fall of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, do I really need 40 foot of, of broccoli? No, I don't. You know, you know, we just right. don't need that much. So I'm going to bring all of that back down, bring it to a more manageable level, and I still got those plots I can use for my watermelons and my corn in the springtime. But after that, so we let them lay aside and do, do a better job. So a few tips for success I wrote down here for the, the beginner or the person that's interested in establishing a garden. Kind of try to answer that question, how big should your garden be? And we gave you a lot of variables, gave you some suggestions there. So my first tip would be to start, whether you're doing raised beds or whether you're doing in-ground garden, start with just a few raised beds or a single plot, whatever your scale may be. I think a four by eight is a perfect size for a raised bed. I do too. Just based on what measurements lumber comes in. You ain't going to waste any lumber well, there. Well, not only that, but it's accessible from both sides. If you got it four feet, you can reach in on two foot on two sides. Right. So it's ideal. So think about a four by eight raised bed or say a 20 by 20 or if you're a little ambitious, a 40 by 40 in-ground plot. We like square plots or try to get them as square as we can. So start with just a few raised beds if that's what you want to do. Or if you do an in-ground garden, start with like a 20 by 20 and a 40 by 40. And then what I would recommend doing if you've got land, when you do want to make your garden bigger, build another raised bed or build you another 20 by 20 or 40 by 40 plot. Don't turn that plot into a 60 by 60 or 80 by 80 because that's where things can get out of hand on you. So just build you another plot instead of just making that one plot bigger. That way, if you do want to break it back down or you want to take some time off from gardening, you can let one of them rest and just bring it back down to a smaller garden. It works so much better that way, I can tell you from experience. Number two here, and this is where um, everybody jumps in too deep. Don't try to be good at everything all at once, especially if you're just starting out. You're not going to, there's crops that we stink at growing, and we've been doing it a long time. You're not going to be good at every single crop. So, you know, take you a few, do your research, study up on it, and just try to master a few at a time. If you just want to pick potatoes, corn, and beans or whatever, and you're a brand new gardener, just master a few at a time and then kind of add to your repertoire. I felt that's what we have done over the years um, ourselves. You, you're not going to just home run every single crop every time. As rewarding as I think, and as much as I love to grow corn and watermelons, I think that's two crops to begin a gardener with a small backyard garden, a 2020 should probably stay away from. What was that, watermelon? Which one? Uh, corn. I think green beans, I think... It's hard if you're a beginner gardener. It's hard to understand the nutrient needs on corn. And to be honest with you, especially on watermelons, you need room for watermelons. You need a general idea how to do those. They work a lot better transplanted. You need them on drip, you know, for them to work well. They have different fertilizer requirements. They require pollination. So those are the two I would kind of stay away from. If you're dealing with a small 20 by 20 garden, stick with those green beans. Stick with those few plants of cucumbers. Taters summer are squash, easy. Potatoes. Stick on those crops. It's easy to grow. It's going to be really rewarding that you're going to be proud of. Yeah. And tomatoes, a uh, lot oh, of yeah, times tomatoes. tomatoes can be tough for some people yeah. initially, but... But the reward is high on those. I mean, right. man, you get you one of those big, fine... But like a great beginner one is, if, especially if you get one of these good disease-resistant varieties, a good trellis cucumber. It's hard to mess that up. Yep. Uh, you might have a little pest problem, but that's a great one to start yep. with. So don't try to just 
don't don't try to uh, be good at everything initially. Started you a few carrots. I probably wouldn't re recommend carrots for a beginner. They take a little finesse. Yep. And the last one here, focus on getting your soil right in the beginning. And the first year you grow in a new garden plot is going to be the worst year you have in it. It's just going to be tough. I experienced that with my dream garden firsthand. First year in there, it don't matter what you do to that soil, it's going to be tough to get it right. Just keep plugging away. Second year be better. Third year be better. Try to focus on getting your soil right, whether that's compost, working on your weed seed bank before you plant. pH. Do, do your due diligence there. Yep. All right. So if you have any more questions or, or any suggestions as far as what your, however big your family is and how, what size of garden you found it takes to feed your family. We'd love to hear that in the comments below. Please, you know, give us your input on that. We've got a few questions from last week's show here. Yep. First one comes from Gypsy B. It says, oh, you ain't supposed to say that word. Oh, uh, just call, let's just call her B. Just B says, uh, what would you suggest the first step should be after taking out a bunch of trees, some pine, some hickory, to get the garden air ready? So this, this segues well from what we was just talking about. So we did that with my dream garden. We come in there and pushed up a bunch of pine trees. They weren't super big. It was about that big around. And uh, the first year growing in them was tough. I didn't, I knew this, but I didn't realize how much nutrients those trees were just sucking out of that soil. I mean, it was, there was nothing there uh, as far as nutrient value. And um, I didn't, I didn't find that good gin trash compost until after my first year in there. I did put some manure down, but the manure was not uh, complete and balanced like that compost is and uh, had some just some serious, serious issues. So if you're going to do that, give yourself plenty of time. I was in a little too big of a hurry with mine. Give yourself plenty of time. Find you a good bulk compost source. Put it down heavily. Get you a soil test. Make sure your pH was right. My pH was pretty good. I just didn't have any nutrients there. It's unusual. Most of the time with a new, especially if you had the hardwoods on it, your pH is going to be real low. So, so the cheap way to fix that is do your pH and find out how much lime you need. Sweeten that soil up. That's one of the first things I'd do. Plan ahead of time there and then be ready to amend the fire that soil. Be ready to fertilize heavily. I don't have to fertilize as much now as I did in the beginning. Be ready to kind of have to pump the nutrients to them and baby those plants that first year or two, but you'll get it right. Number two is from ES, and uh, ES says, great show with very helpful info. What about surfactants? This is talking about our pest control products. Are they helpful, and is there a situation where they should be mixed with the pest control products? Oh, absolutely. These, these places for them. Now, we don't use them a lot, and the reason we didn't mention is we don't use surfactants a lot with insecticides and fungicides. We use mostly surfactants with herbicides to get them spread out on their leaves. So it's not a huge issue with insecticides and fungicides. I mean, if you got something that's got a real waxy build up on the leaf that has a hard time holding it, you may want to use it. Like a some, collard? Like a collard. I could see we could use maybe. you got to be careful with them. You will get some burn because they'll cover up and smother that leaf. But uh, we just don't use a lot with insecticides. I can't hardly think of a reason why I would use them with insecticide or fungicide. Now, herbicides, totally different story. We use a lot of them. They have a lot of benefits there, but can't think of a lot of reasons to use them. Okay. All right, next one says, uh, it's from Eve, Eva, Eva, E-W-A, how you pronounce it? Eva, maybe. Eva Hall. It says, how long did the canary melon store for I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow it this coming summer. Just curious if it keeps for a while. So this is, I, <clears throat> I I grow those canary melons, and I, I'm really interested in trying some more melons this year. Adding that to my repertoire. That's one thing that stopping the market farming has allowed me to to do. We grow those canary melons. We tried them on the show. We had a couple that weren't quite ready, and then we had one that was pretty good. I put them underneath my barn on my little storage rack. And now keep in mind, I grew these during the middle of the summer and I was harvesting them, I feel like, right in the dog days around here. And I was able to get them to store for uh, close to two months. I think if you grew them off, if you plant them in the middle of the summer and you went for more of a fall harvest, they would store for much longer. Uh, even underneath that barn, it still, 
it gets blazing hot uh, sometimes. So I, I, I was able to get a couple months, not out of all of them. I lost a few, uh, a couple months out of a majority of them, but I would say you might could get longer than that if, if uh, it wasn't so daggum hot. Mm -hmm. Number four is from Sydney D. Brooks and said, uh, Greg saw the seedless watermelons on site. What's your favorite watermelon ever? What's your favorite yellow meated watermelon? Uh, thank you so much. Mm. My favorite watermelon of all time is Crimson Sweets. And it's an open pollinated variety that's been around since I believe back in the 60s. It's got a nice thick rind on there. It's got good flavor to it. It is a seeded variety. It goes back to my childhood some. That may be the reason I like it so well. I don't know. I've just known about it forever. I've grown it for years and years and years. It's my all time favorite. However, the best watermelon I've ever eaten in my life, we ate on this show not too long ago, and it was a yellow meated watermelon called Baby Doll. Now, I'm gonna grow me some baby, I didn't grow that. Our, our uh, gene pot uh, grew those and shared them with us. Man, they was off the chain. So I'm gonna grow some Baby Dolls this year, and a little birdie told me we got something similar coming like that that's a seedless one. Yes, yeah, so we got one coming that's, um, I thought, Unless something comes up and I'm not able to get it. when I mean, we got packets printed and everything. We got one called Treasure Chest, which is a seedless variety of baby doll. Um, so you could you could plant baby doll as a pollinizer for it. You just wouldn't know till you open it up whether it had seeds or not. Um, but now that baby doll was a small one. Yeah, I'm yeah this treasure this, chest yeah, is. It's too. like what we call an ice. Box. That might be what you want to try. Is personal size ice box, whatever you want to call it. But I'm gonna tell y'all what. Now this thing was off the chain. As I like to say, it was the cat's meow. Now them sangrias you grew were pretty. They were good. Right? They were good. But I, I mean, I have to go. I love that crimson sweet sangria. Was a, was probably a little bit sweeter than crimson sweets was. But that's just what I'm used to. You know how we get hung up on something growing year after year. Now, some people did comment they grew that baby doll, and maybe we just got wrapped up in how good it tastes. They said that it had a lot a lot of seeds in it relative to other watermelons, and it yeah, might have. I did, it may have. I didn't, we, yeah. we, it didn't uh, bother us any. But we, are, we do hope to have the seedless variety, uh, and you can plant those. Next one comes from Joe Hodges. He says, great show as always. I've learned a lot from watching your shows and videos. I still have lots of bees and pollinators around. What would be your recommendation, recommendation for applying pest control products to minimize harm to those pollinators? Thanks, Joe. Joe, that's a great question. Yep, so uh, everybody's garden may not be as well lit as mine is, but I've got to, we have to pay extra for it, but I've got a pole out by my barn with a big light on it, almost like a street light. And uh, even when it gets dark, I can't see well enough to, to go, uh, you know, sow a patch on my britches or anything like that, but I can see well enough to walk through the garden and not step all over my plants. So I always recommend spraying right before dark, or in my case, because I got kids to get to bed and stuff, I usually go out there at 8 o'clock at night, 8, 8.30, and I spray mine. Now I can see in my garden pretty well, especially once I get out there and my eyes get acclimated, but I spray after dark. You spray right before dark, anytime there. Don't spray in the middle of the day when the pollinators are out. Right before dark, or once it is dark, you'll be just fine. Or early in the morning. You can do it early in the morning. You gotta be careful on, with some of the products spraying early in the morning because they sit on them leaves. Uh, it could cook them a little bit. Yep. Where's my last page? Last one for you here is from Linda Estelle. And she wants to know which of these tools would be easier for an older lady, the push-pull hoe or the stirrup hoe? Man, Linda, that's a tough one right there. Now, we have this problem periodically that we'll have somebody order one of these products and they get it and they just cannot understand how to use it. And I always try to push them to a YouTube story or YouTube video to find out how you use those. I think the stirrup hoe would probably be better, but the main thing is understanding how these work. And once you understand how they work, it kind of clicks with you and you get it. We have a lot of people use the push-pull hoe. I personally would go with the stirrup hoe. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, it, it depends on how strong you are. I think the push-pull hoe is lighter uh, and a little easier to use. The stirrup hoe is a little heavier. Uh, but it's just a different different motion. You know, with the stir hoe, you're doing more like this, almost like a traditional hoe. With the push-pull hoe, 
you're doing this motion here. Yeah. Whatever one you're more comfortable with, uh, I would say go with a push pull is lighter, stirrup hose is a little heavier. Uh, if it's real big, nasty weeds, the stirrup hoe has got that spring steel yeah. blade on there. As far as just maintaining stuff, the push pull works good. I had someone that though they asked me the question. They were wanting to use. They were wondering which one they should get, and they were wanting to use them in mulch or wood chips or something. In that case, I would highly recommend the push pull hose. The stirrup hose is not going to work real good. I don't no. think. Or if mulch. you're working underneath mainline tubing or either hard to reach places, the push pull works better. Stirrup hose is a great tool. Go find you some YouTube channels where they're using one of the, or both of them. Kind of get an idea which one you think would work best for you. All right, all right, all right. So, hope everybody enjoyed that show tonight. I'm subject to eat me some more of that here in a minute. And um, if you have any questions, comments about anything we talked about, please put those um, in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to give us a big thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. If you haven't already, ring that little bell so you get notified Absolutely. every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's show, check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.